Thank you so very much, Dan. It's really, really a pleasure for me to be here to share with you some information about wellness. Um, today's goals are for me to present seven keys for you for health and wellness, and I'll also go into the science that's behind uh, each one of these keys. My goal is really to help you come to see that learning about health is an aspect that is so important to lifelong learning, which we all want to do, and a path to your own own wellness and your vitality. Now, how do we learn about health and wellness? There's a number of ways we do this. One is that we study people who have lived a long life. And in particular, we tend to sometimes study people in countries where there's a lot of people that are older, like individuals who live to be 100 or more. And this often brings us to look at Japan and Okinawa, where there are 50, in Japan there are 58,000 individuals over 100 years old. We study twins. We also look at and study animals, and we study genes. And genes are very, very important, as we all know, but I'm going to have a little bonus in the middle of my talk, and I'll explain to you how you can actually change your genes. Because many of us, when we grew, you know, when we were early in our lives, we were told that when you're born, you sort of have all the brain cells you'll ever have, and that they all start to decay after 40. It's not true. It's not true. So I that stand by for that bonus. But that does raise the question here, and you see it on this pie chart. What determines each of our health? What, it, what are the main factors? Genes are important, but remember, you can do something about those. Uh, but genes explain about 30%. Then there's the social situation in which you live. Like, you could be born in a country that's war-torn right now, um, versus you know being here, living in a social situation in, in the, this beautiful hall in the Jewish Community Center. The physical environment is also important. We can be exposed to toxins in our environments, and those can impact our health. Health care is important. But the most important, and notice it's the biggest part of the pie here. Let me see if I can get this to work. Um, I hope so. The biggest part of the pie here, 40% is how we live our lives. And this is what you choose to do. And the seven keys that I'm going to be describing to you are all things that are under your control. So you have a major part to play in all of this. You are in the driver's seat. And I know this is kind of a weird picture, but it's supposed to be you sitting behind the wheel of a car looking down the road, a very long road that I want all of you to be on so that we can do as Christian Bernard said, and that is die young as late as possible. That's what we all want. So you're in the driver's seat and you're in control. And that's what my talk will highlight. Choices that you make each day can help you live better, not just longer. And that's the goal, to have resilience and to have a sense of wellness and good health. And as I say, as you change your lifestyle, you can change your genes. And this is the field that's called epigenetics. Epi meaning around the genetics because genes turn off, turn on, and I'm gonna to talk to you about how we can keep our genes from unraveling, which is very important. So let's first look at how Americans are doing. Now, Americans as a group, there was a really great study, a phone survey that was done of over 153,000 U.S. adults, and they asked them about four key habits. They asked them about not smoking, and they were actually looking at current not smoking, maintaining a healthy weight, exercising regularly, and eating a healthy diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, those four things. And what they found was only 3% answered yes to all four. Now this did not include a lot of people living in San Francisco. I think we would have done a little bit better in California, but by and large, Americans are not doing very well in these areas. I think we've done better at s cutting back on smoking for adults, but where we are, we are having some struggles with issues around weight and so forth and so on, and the diet. So that was in America. Let's look at another study that sort of shows what happens as you begin to adopt maybe a healthier lifestyle. And you can say, gee, I score two. And maybe if I listen to Donald Abrams in the next lecture, I can make some changes in my diet and I'll get up to three. So this next slide shows you, and this is now using a study that was done in Europe, what happens if you can sort of stack these cards in your favor? So looking at this, here you can see in this 
I just said 3% of Americans said yes to all four. The people in Europe are doing better. We're in a race with them. They had 9.1% people said they were doing all four. Europeans um, are a little bit ahead of us in general on their health. And then you see that they had 4% here that said they were not doing any of the four at all. And then the others span the spectrum. They, in the European study, 50% had, they used never smoking. They had 84% who were less than a body mass index of 30. 30 is the mark of so it's sort of a score that physicians use that means a person is obese. And then overweight is being over 25 in body mass index. But these were, you know, 84% of the people were not in that range. Um, and 50% were eating a healthy diet and so forth. What does that mean? Well, this slide shows you what what that means because they looked at these people health and they studied them over time and the people that had um, here scored zero they weren't doing any of the four and these are the Europeans that um, they had a higher rate a risk if you will of diabetes myocardial infarction see the zero being higher stroke and cancer. And then as people begin to have one positive habit, two, three, and four, especially the risk of diabetes drops off. The risk of myocardial infarction also drops off. The risk of stroke drops down cancer. So you can see if you can think about this afternoon making small steps so that you can go from say zero to one, two, three, or four, then you participate in this group that sees this drifting down down, and you're enhancing your health. And this is all, you're in the driver's seat. I want to tell you a secret, though, about making changes. How many of you have tried to make some changes in your health from time to time? You know, improve your diet. A lot of us raise our hands. And then some of us slip back. How many of you have ever slipped back on your plan? Oh, lots of hands. I always do. If you want it to work, as I give ideas, you need to think, which of these is going to be easy for me? Which do I enjoy? And can I really sustain this? Like, a really good way of doing exercise, and I'm, I'm going to share some things about me, is swimming. I like to swim. I do not have access easily to a pool. I would have to get in my car, drive at 6 a.m. to go swimming. And I have to tell you, I have kind of wild hair. It likes to do its own thing. After it's been in a pool, it loves to do its own you know, It's a mess. And so for me, while I like it, it's not easy. It's not that enjoyable because I have to race home. I got to figure out what to do with my hair that looks kind of like a mop. And it's not sustainable. My best friend, who only lives blocks from me, gets up every morning. And she is there. And she swims a mile five times a day. Or five times a week. Excuse me. It should be a day. I'm sorry. She does it five times a week, sometimes six and seven. I cannot do that. And so for me, that doesn't work. It might have even been better for me. But it's not easy, enjoyable, or sustainable. So instead, I I have a stationary bicycle because I sort of, you know, have to find time and so I get on that and I feel like one of those little rats, you know, running and then I do, I, I bicycle and that does something. So that's sort of my, if I haven't done anything all day, that is something that I can do. Um, so this is really important that as you outline changes or diet or changes in exercise or eat, you know, all these kinds of things, you have to think, what will I do? What fits for me? What would I enjoy and what can I do? And that's going to make it easier for you to make changes. Now, I'm going to fill out this list of all the seven keys. The first one is to maintain a nutritious diet and a healthy weight. Now, the speaker after me is a wonderful dear friend of mine, Donald Abrams. He is one of the world's experts on nutrition and diet. So we kind of got together and I said, I'll talk about the seven keys. Would you do the diet? So he's going to focus on that and you will learn absolutely the best science from him on that. And I'll focus on the issue of weight, maintaining a healthy weight. This can be a challenge, and I'm going to explain why it's such a challenge. Two-thirds of American are, Americans are now overweight. This has become much more of a problem since around 1980, significantly more of a problem. Uh, you know, it's really noticeable. How many of you have noticed that people's weights around the country have seemed to go up? How many of you have noticed that? It's been happening. Uh, 
this, these data from 2005 that said 300,000 U.S. adults each year will die of uh, obesity-related conditions, that the data, are, that's out of date. I've got to check that. I'm sure it's now. We're talking 400,000 or more. Here's why. Okay, I can tell you why. This is not surprising. We are hardwired in our brains and the way our body handles food to eat. You've got to think back to cave person days or cave man and cave woman days. You know, that food was not always available. Humans were, are wired to have an appetite to eat, to want to eat, to eat when food is available. You know, so if you're a cave person and there's some fish right there and all you have to do is reach down or crabs in the, you know, right by the, you know, the shore and you reach in, you will eat when the food is available. And then our bodies are designed to hold on to fat and fat stores. And then, you know, so that we can go up maybe a few days before and eat shrubs and things like that until we find more fish. That's how we're wired. But we are now consuming many more calories than our, our grandparents did. And we need actually fewer calories as we age. So how is this happening? But uh this is the answer. We have supersized food. Food is available everywhere. You know, we're supposed to be like cave persons walking along and then, you know, oh my goodness, you know, here's some food for me to eat. Here's a tree that happens to be in bloom. You can buy apples from all over the world all of the time. That's good. But also, you can also find ice cream everywhere all of the time. And it's, these are highly palatable foods. This means high in sugar, fat, and salt. You know, and you know, I, we all have like our very favorite thing we splurge on. For me, it would be dark chocolate with a little sea salt. Well, guess what? That is sugar, fat, and salt right there. You know, so what I do is I every once in a while I go and I buy just one. Because otherwise, if I buy a bunch and I put it in my house, they call for me. You know, they're there and they go, Margaret, Margaret. You know, so I can't do that. I, I just don't have that kind of control. But we find that even with youngsters, children, this is what they grab. They, pe people, this is very palatable worldwide. So by the way, the obesity epidemic, which was reported on really in the last days, you've heard about this, that diabetes will in 40 years take the lives of 442, or 442 million people around the world will have diabetes. There's a weight explosion in India and China because of these kinds of issues, food being available but not just food. All of us in this room, and I will tell you, I'm 66, going on 67. Uh, I remember this. Food has changed size. Remember McDonald's, and I mean, you were all so healthy, you didn't go there, but <laughs> my family did. Um, and so cheeseburgers used to be 330 calories. They have now doubled in size. They cost more, but they've increased the size. Drinks, you know, now, you know, you used to be, you'd order a small drink and it would be six to eight ounces, and now it's 12 ounces, 20 ounces. You can't even get small drinks many places. Um, and the French fries did, it's, this shows my age, how many of you remember French, well of course you were good, you didn't eat these, but um, I remember the French fries in these little containers, and then all of a sudden, poof, they, absolutely tripled in size. And Donald will tell you, these are not good, not good. So if he says, do you eat french fries, you, know, you want to just don't raise your hand. You know, they, they, they're really not, they're sort of fat sponges. OK, so the portions have gotten really large. I won't go into detail on this, but there are plates that you can buy that can describe what a portion is. Our main source of protein, say a piece of chicken that we should have you know, say in the evening, should be the size of a mouse, but not a little mouse, this kind of a mouse, a deck of cards, or the palm of your hand. And you know when you go to a restaurant, you know, these things are all super sized. And this is a problem. So, you know, Donald will talk more about what you should eat. I'm going to just talk about portions. Portions, portions, portions. This is something that is a challenge for many of us, especially if you go out to a restaurant. So here are just some options. And this, again, you have to say, would this be comfortable for me? But maybe when I go out with my sister, we will split, we'll have two salads or split a salad, split an entree. We're full. 
you know, and then, you know, if we've been really good, we might split some small sherbet or something as a treat. Um, split entrees using smaller plates. This actually works. You know, our plates have gotten really large, and that little mouse of chicken on a big plate looks really kind of measly. But if you put the mouse on a salad plate, this looks better. So actually, one of the things that's recommended is if you're going to have a small amount of food, to eat on a smaller plate. And, that, and eat slower and all these kinds of things. One thing I want to highlight, too, is drinking calories. Um, we need to hydrate. This is really important for all of us, but water works really well. Hot water, cold water, tea, but many people end up drinking a lot of calories with juices and things like that, which have often a lot of sugar in them. So these are just some pointers for you to think about some changes that you could make in looking at, at your portions that you eat to help you get down to a diet that is uh, or a healthier weight for your Yourselves. The second key is exercise, which actually also helps us maintain a healthy weight. Um, move every day. 60% of U.S. adults don't exercise regularly. 25% of adults are sedentary. That means they get up and they go sit and then they sleep. But they basically do very, very little movement or activity. Uh, one in 20 of us actually works up a sweat on any given day. This is not the way our grandparents or even our parents lived. They were more active. And so one of the things that you know will always come after people talk about this is like, OK, how much exercise do you need to stay healthy? And everyone talks about two and a half hours per week of moderate exercise, like brisk walking, or if you can do vigorous exercise. And I have a chart that you'll have in your notes. This will be online at the on the community center's website. You can do vigorous exercise, like really vigorous tennis or vigorous bicycling. You can do one and a quarter hours. Forget all that. What we really want to talk about is avoid inactivity and become more active. And I've got some data that's really promising about this. You don't have to worry about the past. Just think about becoming more active today or tomorrow. Um, so if two and a half hours of even slow walking is something that's too challenging, be as active as your abilities and your conditions allow. It's important to, to just really think about your condition um, with a history of a chronic condition. You should discuss this with your physician, or you've also got here at the fitness center some wonderful people that can advise you. This is, um, you want to think about what's really going to be enjoyable, easy for you, and sustainable to just increase your activity a little bit. You could take, for example, Tai Chi, or I actually participated in Robin Hall's yoga class. I came in a little early, and do things that just maintain and improve balance. She had a gentle yoga class with primarily chair exercises that is really, and she even adjusted that exercise for people in that the room. It was held at the back of this hall. She adjusted that for people who had conditions. So the idea here is to not become militant about two and a half hours per week, but just say, you know what? I could move and be more physically active, and I'd get one of those four points. So in this slide here, really, and you'll have this available to you, that we want to look at the light exercise. Walking, even slowly, walking with a walker or a cane is great activity. And just think about maybe increasing that. Uh, you know, a couple times this week, maybe a little bit more. Um, I've listed some other things, this stationary cycling. You can actually, if you're in a wheelchair, there's even a kind of pair of pedals that you can get so you can move your legs, which actually increases your circulation throughout your whole body. So I want you to just think about things you enjoy doing that might give you some options for being more active. These data are what I hinted at earlier. It's never too late. This is the best news. A study was done by Greg, um, looked at these is, is women. This has also been looked at in men. It's the same. They looked at 7,553 older women who were community dwelling, and they followed them for 12 years. 
and they looked at those who had remained sedentary or became sedentary, which is what we don't want. That's mean in basically people that just sat all the time, or had used to exercise and became sedentary and followed them for 12 years. And then they had groups that either had been active or what I'm thinking for you and for me is to become active. And this slide shows the different groups. Here at the top, in the green and the pink, are the participants in their study who either were sedentary or remained sedentary, and their death rates, we hate to talk about this, but the mortality is pretty high. This, these two groups were the people who had been active, or if you're not that active now, you can join this group. These were people who in this study at older ages actually became active. And look at this. They sliced, they basically doubled the length of time. They sliced the mortality in half. So this is incredibly promising. It doesn't mean you have to go out and do two and a half hours. It's just be a little more active today, this week, build it up to what is comfortable for you. And here's for cardiovascular disease again. The people who were either sedentary all along or became sedentary versus those who were active. And this was not vigorous exercise, this was just very moderate exercise. So the news is very good. You're in the driver's seat um, for this as well. Looking now and thinking about how you could, how can you integrate activity in your daily life? If you drive a car and you, instead of circling and looking for a place that's really, really close to the front door, you could park a little bit, if you're able, a little bit further from the front door of the store and walk slowly. And just sort of enjoy, keep your eyes alert. Don't wear iPods and, and look at your phone. To be alert and do a little more walking. Take stairs, not all the stairs, take the stairs some of the time to go to the second floor somewhere. If upstairs is hard, do downstairs. Get off the bus early if you ride a bus one stop early. Um, there are great programs, great programs here. I have to say, amazing programs at, at this center. The fitness center is here, programs for all levels of activity. But you might also be a person who doesn't want to do things in a group. If so, KQED has a whole section on fitness, fitness activities. My husband just went through chemotherapy, and he used to be very active, and he has been doing sit and be fit chair yoga. Um, you know, he couldn't do it actually when he was going through chemo, but as he was in recovery, he had to start back with Marianne Wilson, 10 o'clock every day. He was there with stretch bands and doing these exercises, doing chair yoga, and you know, is working his way back into health. And so, you know, you can do this, and they're wonder that's private, all you need is a chair and, you know, TV, and it's actually on it several times during the day. So KQED, if you're kind of a private person, this community center, you know, has all these amazing classes and talented people that lead them who really know what they're doing. Oops, I jumped ahead. Um, so, but I want you to say, I, I, again, find something you will do that fits for you. Exercise with friends, set a goal, and then keep track. The main thing is to move from being sedentary all day to becoming more active. Now there are these public health guidelines that you can get a pedometer, and if you have a pedometer, then you want to walk 10,000 steps a day. Well, that's for very fit people. You can get a pedometer, and if you go out to the Osher booth between my talk and Get Back for Donald's, um, my colleague is there, Mary Destry, and you can sign up and she'll mail you a free pedometer from the Osher Center. Uh, but there are other ways to get pedometers there. They cost a few dollars. The fitness center may even have them here. And you can keep track of your steps. And maybe you just want to sort of wear it one day and see what you do. And then say, I want to increase 200 steps today. I'm going to increase, I'm going to do 300. You don't have to go for 10,000. But this makes a difference. There have been studies, to, we looked at 26 studies that examined whether or not people who wore pedometers actually changed what they did. And they work. They showed that people improved their activity activity levels 27%. They took 2,000 more steps a day just wearing these things. They decreased their body mass index because you lose weight if you walk.
walk. And this is just walking. And they decrease their blood pressure. And there are all kinds of new gadgets, too, if you have an iPhone. Other phones have apps for this. There's a Fitbit. Here's the Fitbit that um, you can wear. Some of you probably have these or know people that do. The Apple Watch. There are all kinds of ways to just get up and get going. So I want you to think about this. Tomorrow you'll sort of get back into your everyday life and you'll be doing what you do. And then I want you to remember the woman in the turquoise blue jacket who said, get up and just take a couple strolls around the living room, maybe go up a flight of stairs, just begin to take that step. The next step from in the keys is to stay active mentally. And you've probably heard a lot about this. This is important. We have learned that we can grow new neurons. That this is, be, you know, with these new technologies of scans for the brain, we understand more about the brain and that you can do things to make connections in, in your brain. How do you do that? You do that by exercising your mind. So we've exercised the body, now you can exercise your mind. You can do this by doing something new. That works better. It's fine to do, if you love crossword puzzles or Sudoku, keep doing that. But if you can pick up some new things that challenges your mind more, the studies show that it's that challenge of the mind that makes your mind work and create those new neurons. A really good friend of mine is, who's right-handed is making himself right left-handed. And that's really hard if you're dominant in one or the other because you have to really concentrate your brain. You can feel it working, trying to make your hand move and to make those shapes. He also is into doing what we did in the gentle yoga class, which is balancing on one foot. So see, can I take off my sock by standing on one leg and then try the other leg? What happens then is your periphery, that's your feet, has to talk to your brain. Your brain then starts to talk to your other leg and say, hey, you better get ready, we may need you. And the body starts to do this whole thing of connecting. So you can do new things like Tai Chi or yoga or these kinds of exercises that require this connectivity. I know you've heard about all the games too. 225 million was spent in 2007, probably more today. There are games on your iPhone. These are fine. Cl some clinical trials show that games like Lumosity work. Others are kind of questioning it and say, well, you get to play the game better. But I think that that's a good thing because then you are exercising your mind, building those neurons, but you might have to shift games from time to time. Picking up an instrument that you haven't paid, played for a long time or learning an instrument is another way to do that. Or take a class here that requires you to do something new. Um, we're not yet clear if these games do work, but we do know that you do get better at them and sometimes you play with other people and down the road on keys, that's also important. So keep your mind active. A key here is to do mental exercise. Even in a class like this, listening, thinking, then thinking about your life, that's mental exercise. The other is to do this over time, to build it into your daily life in different ways. So next, after this day of being careful you know, about our weight, doing a little more exercise, some mental, we need to get some sleep. Sleep is another really important critical key to our health and wellness. And this slide shows you, and this will be in your notes uh, and online, all the things that happen if we don't get adequate sleep. We reduce our productivity. You see this with kids in school. It's so important. Teens need a lot of sleep. Um, increased accidents. You've probably heard about bus drivers that fell asleep while driving. And I won't ask for a show of hands, but the, some of us have driven long distances. And you can get to the place where you're sort of thinking, I'll just drive with one eye. Not good. No, no, no. Pull over. Jumping jacks. Pull over and rest area. Take a quick nap. Napping is good. Um, not getting enough sleep, it decreases our cognitive performance. It, it, it's just general health declines. 
So um, it also increases our health care costs. We do see de increased mortality rates at people who have regularly sleep six or fewer hours in general. Now, there are some people that can do that. They live, you know, to 100. But the majority of us need in the range about seven to eight hours a night. It is individual. The amount that you need, you say, well, what's the right amount? And, you know, and the, it really is, I'm going to, you know, I, instead of using a strict rule, what I like to say to people is, do you want the amount of sleep that allows you to feel consistently alert during the day? And as we age, sometimes we take naps, but are you alert during those other times? Can you avoid falling asleep when inactive and relaxed? Now, some of us go to the symphony if we've had a really long week and been writing papers and grants, and this happens to me. I'll be in symphony, and I can find myself, and it could even be a piece I love, and there's adagios, and I'm just, hey, and that's a sign. That is a sign. I've calmed down, I'm relaxing, and I'm sleeping through something that I really love. This is not good. So those are the things. That the average is people talk about eight, eight and a half, seven to eight. You know, this may be genetically determined, but use rule number one. Feel consistently alert, and if you find yourself falling asleep at the wheel or in this class right after lunch, it's, I told Donald, you get to speak it too. I'm going to have everybody when their, you know, their blood sugars are going like this. So if you need to nap while I'm talking, that's okay. This will be online later. So a key thing about sleep, some people think if they sleep less, that they will weigh less. Actually, the data show that people who don't get enough sleep actually tend to put on a little weight, partly because they eat more fat and sugar, which you're going to hear is not healthy. So there are some strategies for more restful sleep. One is to maintain a regular sleep-wake cycle. And then your body will start to let you know how much sleep it needs because you will wake up. So I'm a person that needs about seven hours or so, and I've discovered this, that my body will now wake up. It's weird. Um, maybe you've experienced this too, but if you do this pretty regularly, you can you wake up like a minute before the alarm. It's kind of interesting. So you can use that to gauge if you're getting enough sleep, that your body is naturally, not because you're anxious that you're giving a talk at the JCC and you want to be really good because Donald Abrams is an incredible speaker that comes after you. You know, that you can't let that bother you. You have to have restful sleep. So what you want to do is keep your body in sleep friendly. As you approach bedtime, less caffeine, not a good time to do your exercise watch heavy snacks, and then create a sanctuary. Your bedroom should typically be cool, not too cold, dark, um, not good to have uh, screens, computer screens, that kind of light is not conducive to good sleep. So close, if you have a computer in your room, if you can shut off the screen, that that would be good. Turn off the TV um, or the radio and make it a place and then surrender to sleep. If you have trouble sleeping, you can, um, I would say one thing to do is to get a little more activity and exercise. And then if that doesn't help and you've followed some of these guidelines, then, you know, can talk with your physician to see if the physician, or you can go to the Osher Center of Integrative Medicine, talk to an integrative physician to see if there's some other things you could do to help this incredibly important time. There are apps, as many of you may know and have on your iPhone, that are sleep trackers that you can tuck under your bed that, you know, will I sometimes identify the ideal time for, to wake you. Uh, there's not a lot of really good science on these. Even the articles that are slightly critical will say some people really find that this helps. So if you've been interested in those, that could be something else to look at. So now, let me touch on the idea that you can do something that impacts your genes. And this has to do with telomeres. We kind of like to tell the story because it has a lot to do with Elizabeth Blackburn, UCSF, and discoveries here. The telomeres are part of your, the DNA. They are at the ends of your chromosomes. You know, you've got the, the chromosomes, and at the end are these little 
aglet type things called telomeres. It's like shoelaces. And you know how when that little plastic end on your shoelace comes, or breaks off, then the shoelace begins to unravel? If your telomeres at the end of your chromosomes get too short, your chromosomes start to unravel. And believe me, that's not good, not good. So we want to keep those long. We know that they get shortened if, as we age, so we're, you're sort of got to be aware of that. If we get sick, poor sleep, so I always do this right after sleep, and under stress, and that'll be my seventh um, key for a healthy lifestyle. So what, there's evidence to show that you may be actually able to lengthen your telomeres um, by changing some of your lifestyle and by stress management. And there's one study I'd like to share with you because it's UCSF, it's San Francisco. Dean Ornish did this with Peter Carroll. Um, they were looking at men who had were at risk for prostate cancer, but they were in that watchful waiting period of time for active surveillance, and they got great active surveillance. 25 of the men had that. 10 men were studied over a few years, but 10 of them were also, in addition to active surveillance, they changed their exercise, uh, oops, um, they changed their diet, they ch did stress reduction, and they increased their social support. And by doing these, and number six and seven are social support and connectedness and stress reduction, those are the other keys, they actually lengthened their telomeres. So if you listen closely and make some thoughtful changes here, you may also be able to take the chromosomes and keep those ends of the chromosomes tight um, by making lifestyle changes. Uh, there's the slide I was looking for. Now, reduce inflammation. There's a very, very simple hint that I've hidden in this uh, very important thing we want to do. Inflammation, we are now increasingly understanding, is something that occurs in our body that is very, very negative. It can underscore and increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, increase your risks of cancer, and so forth. It's something we want to avoid. How can you reduce inflammation? You can exercise. I'm gonna talk about stress management. Dr. Abrams is gonna talk about anti-inflammatory diets and healthy diets, but there's one other very, very simple thing that you can do that will also help with this, floss. So one of the keys is flossing. This is simple, this is easy. You can even do it in front of the TV while you're being sedentary. Um, I don't recommend doing it in the car, but indeed I do have floss in my car. I have it by the TV, I have it throughout the house. So this is something that is really, really valuable for you to, to just think about. It's very inexpensive. In the the uh, pharmacies have all kinds of flossing tools, but consider doing this regularly because periodontal disease increases is a risk factor for heart disease and stroke, if you have lung, uh, gum diseases, it increases risk for diabetes. There are all these studies that show it increases inflammation. So, floss, it's something you can easily do. The last two hints are something I want to go through real quickly. One is easy for you to do, particularly if you're part of JCC San Francisco, and that's staying connected. I mean, there are all these amazing classes, um, daytime club and games in the brochures out front, amazing things, uh, gentle arts club, bridges, um, bridge games, mahjong, clay classes. We know now that meaningful relationships are the most consistent predictor of quality of life. Ha that pe people who live longer, those people in Japan and all this, they often are very connected. And it can be platonic, romantic, just friends, family. Loneliness is a risk factor. People that are lonely have three to seven times increased mortality. It's just really, really bad. A US survey showed that one in four Americans who'd had some traumatic event had not even told anyone about it. And outside at the Institute on Aging, I just learned that there's a new friendship line, and you can pick up that phone and talk to someone. These are things you can do to reduce a sense of loneliness, but there are all kinds of things to do here at the community center, and I've listed some here, uh, belonging to clubs, joining things, but it can just be one or two people you call on the phone. We don't know if social media helps, but maybe it does. 
So now I just want to close out with something, and although um, I know we're not supposed to have handouts, I asked my colleague to come through, and she gave you all a sheet of paper on it. Is a everything, I did a lot of research for decades on stress management, and I've tried to boil it down to something that I hope you'll save. Maybe put it on your refrigerator. It's how to outsmart stress, and it's all tucked into the word breathe. So just, we'll go through these letters really quickly and then have questions, and um, I think we have a few minutes for that before Donald will, uh, Dr. Abrams will speak it too. The first part of breathe is breathe. So close your eyes for t just a second. Breathe in, breathe in through your mouth. Just breathe in, feel your feet on the floor, your body in the chair. Let your shoulders drop and exhale. Breathe in again. Feel present in this hall with these wonderful people around you, knowing it's sunny outside. Just be present. Open your eyes. You can do this anytime you want. We do it all day. You want to breathe like a little baby with your stomach coming in and out. You know how babies lie there and their little tummies go up and down. So breathe. Start with a breath. The second is set realistic goals for the day. For this moment, you have done a beautiful, wonderful thing today. You have achieved your goal. You came to this, and I want you to celebrate that goal. You go, this is when you pat yourself on the back. Yes, I set the goal. People under stress make many, many lists, and you know you're in trouble if you actually do something and then you put it on the list so you can cross it off. You know, this is what people do. It's like, and your lists are too long. You get to the end of the day and you go, oh no, I didn't write those 85 letters and I didn't do this. And you put that list by the bed and you, then you're not going to sleep well and you wake up too early and you're kind of worried. This is stress. Set realistic goals for tomorrow. When you get up tomorrow, just remember, what is the, I want to do these two things. If I do more good, these two I got to get done. Maybe it's just one, but be realistic. This is a real key to handling stress. Another is to notice the positive moments in life, in every day. The beautiful, right now it's a very sunny day, and we're happy about that. This weekend it may rain. We may even be happier about that because we need rain. And then share events with one another. Notice the positive. Also, you need to notice when things go right. And let me tell you, I hate changing tires. And I'm, you're going to see some tires when you leave this building, and I want you to think of me. Why? Because I get really positive moments almost every day of the year. Because when I go out to my car, I look at my tires and I go, yes! It's a great day. They're inflated, you know? Because nothing is more stressful than going out and it's flat, and it's only flat when you need to go somewhere. So I want to tell you, I'm going to go back to my car to head back to my home, and I'm going to have another positive moment. And as you see cars going by you on the road, it's a, this is good. You don't want them to have a flat tire and come up on the curb. So, or notice that tomorrow, if you don't get anything from the IRS, it's a great day. Why do they write on Fridays. I don't understand this. Um, acts of kindness, this will go fast. Create positive events for others. If you see someone who's got the best color on and it just goes with you know, their hair or this is just, they look great and I could tell them, you know, this is wonderful. Sharing positive stories. Um, there is also another part of positive, and that is the T. Turn negative events around. Life brings us tragedies, and that's true, and we all have those. And then in time, turn it around and look for the positive. Some of my research was on stress, and my stress t research taught me all about the power of positives. And I actually published papers on this, that people that have a positive lifestyle also live longer. So there's power in that. I'm just going to show you Michael J. Fox, and this is a hint. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's. He turned it around. 
and he has created a foundation. He has raised over hundreds of millions of dollars that he has pumped out for programs, education, and especially research to find a cure. He took that. It's hard because when we're crushed by something negative, but you can turn it into something powerful. Reframe that picture. Like you know, when you take an old picture, you reframe it and you say, oh, it never looks so, that's incredible. So turn negative events around. H is easy, humor. This slide, two deers in the forest, one looks at the other and goes, ooh, bummer of a birthmark, Hal. These are Larson cartoons. I still miss Gary Larson. I love his cartoons. So laugh. When there's things on television, you know, if there's a, a funny comedy, watch it. Even if you've seen it 20 times, you'll find yourself laughing before the, it even gets to the funny part. The Osher Center on Wednesdays twice a month has laughter yoga. I went a few weeks ago with two friends from Europe. It's fabulous. You go, you think you're in a blue mood, you're tired. It's, it's um, actually the, um, the end of the day, it's at 5, 5.30, I think, and everybody kind of uh, comes in there and they leave like kind of jumping around and hugging people. Laughing, laugh. There's a lot of positive things to laugh about in our lives. And then namaste. You know, end each day with gratitude gratitude. So B-R-E-A-T-H-E, you all have the rules there, the steps. Ending each day, not with that to-do list and going, oh no, I still didn't get that done. No, I got this done. I spoke to some incredibly wonderful people. I learned about the friendship line at Institute on Aging. I want to join. The, I wish JCC was closer to my house. I could learn about clay and um, coffee and clay. You, there are things that you can do. So positive accounting at the end of the day in that peaceful sanctuary for sleep, maybe a gratitude diary. And so here you have the seven keys to health and wellness. You are in the driver's seat here. You really are. You can create your own path. You can take your own steps, maybe that little extra hundred tomorrow, to enhance your health and wellness, increase your resilience and vitality, and you'll improve the quality of your life. Thank you so, so very much. Dan, can we do one question? I can do, we started a bit late, so I can do one question. There's a lady right here. I see her hand up. And here comes the microphone. And we'll do this very quick because Dr. Abrams is here. In the okay, one question about sleeping. It is a whole different thing for seniors because of the hormonal changes in the body and you get fragmented sleep. And I have friends who don't sleep. I mean, they sleep maybe two hours a night if they're lucky. So there really is nothing new for seniors because everything you talk about in improving your quality of sleep relates to the population at large who may be anything from 20 to 50. And it's a different issue for them than it is for seniors. So there's no new thing for seniors out there. I, you know, it is a challenge. And it, it, you're absolutely correct. And I, I, I appreciate your saying that, that as we get older, our sleep-wake cycles do become more broken up. And the, the they're really... Um, aren't any, I think, new things. I, you know, there's, people have looked at melatonin. Some people recommend that. You would want to talk to your physician about that. Um, actually, Donald might even have some suggestions for that. I'm giving him a chance to think about that. Um, one thing that is good to do is if you're having trouble sleeping, to get up. And, you know, go get up, have a quiet time, go do something else until you feel that urge to kind of go to sleep again and go lie down again. That is a, a tool that you can use as a senior. And also to nap during the day. Take advantage, if you can, of those times that you can. And not to, this is actually a natural part for many people as we age, as we get beyond 55, 60, 70. So if you're noticing it, it's normative. So I want to thank you, show gratitude to you for highlighting that because that is normative and it's not something to worry about. It's part of 
just where we are. Um, and you could talk to your physician about uh, medications, but those often have a lot of side effects. And the hint would be for, that I would have is to get up, do something else that can relax you. Uh, there also are courses on meditation that you can use, take at the Osher Center and also here that can also teach you some skills for trying to take advantage of, you know, it, of calming your body. But this is part of, for some of us, of our um, aging cycle. So thank you. So, wasn't that good? So we thank her for asking that one question. And I'm going to step aside so that you can now learn all about diet and nutrition from my colleague, Donald Abrams. Thank you so very much.